Okay, we bring him in now. Our guest today was an early investor and advisor to about every tech app in your phone today, including Twitter, Instagram, and Uber. He at one point has appeared on both Forbes' Midas list and also GQ's Worst Dress list. He is Chris Saka, the co-founder and managing partner of Lower Carbon Capital, joining us from his barn in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Chris, this is fun to have you. Thank you for being with us on In Conversation with Shopify Plus. Yeah, right on. True story. I, I am in my barn. So if you hear a little echo, it's because it's literally a barn. You know, people are going to think I was teasing you with that GQ thing, Chris. But if memory serves, that was something you somewhat proudly made note of in the bio on your company website. Yeah. I mean, look, I think one of the biggest risks in this business or any business is taking your own shit too seriously. And so as much as I'm not going to apologize for some of the things I've accomplished, it's also really important to celebrate those foibles and vulnerabilities that uh, make us human. And so years ago, when I was a public speaker getting paid to show up on these big stages, I was I lived in Truckee, California, near Lake Tahoe. I was headed to the Reno airport to catch a flight to give a speech. At the gift shop, they had this gaudy cowboy shirt, 80% off. I bought it, I wore it on stage. Everyone kind of giggled when I got out there. And I realized it just set this awesome tone where instead of being overly serious about what we were gonna do, Instead, people just chilled out and we got to have a great conversation. And so I came home and I bought the rest. And then that became my move. I've, I've worn those ever since. I mean, even when I went on Shark Tank, uh, they were going to try and put me in a suit. And I was like, I'm sorry, I can't do the show in a suit. And they're like, you're going to walk away from an opportunity in primetime television. I'm like, you guys, I, I don't need this in my life. And there's no way I'm going to wear a suit on television right now. So, um, But the current shirt I'm wearing looks very staid. I just have to point out, it is a... Uh, a professional bull riders tour shirt. So we actually, uh, my wife and I have some bulls on the tour. And so I just didn't want to be considered a sellout because I'm wearing plaid on your show. Okay. So we will get into some more of your backstory soon and pull some insights out of you and ask your view on a whole bunch of things, but we should tell our audience why it's notable that we're speaking with you today. And that is because Chris, not all that long ago, you had in many ways given up the spotlight. In 2017, you retired from venture capital. You walked away from Shark Tank to play back a missive of your own. You said that you were, quote, tapping out at the time in my career when I was most bankable. And you are back now. You have emerged with a new venture business. And it's a big news recently that you've launched funds totaling $800 million in new capital to fight climate change. I wanted to start by asking you, you know, we've heard from you about some of the benefits to being away relief from pitch emails flooding your inbox, more time with your family, a break from an industry that wasn't getting you up jumping out of bed any longer. But what is the opposite to that, Chris? What were the things that you missed most about being at least publicly out of the game? I think to go back to the impetus for leaving, um, my wife and I were cleaning up our garage and I found an old notebook from when I lived in Ireland and I was 20 years old. And in there, this friend and I in class used to write 10 questions to each other and pass the notebook back, answer them, write 10 questions back. We should have been paying attention. We really weren't. But in there, she asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I described a job. I'd never heard of venture capital at the time, but I just described this job that was like, well, whatever it is, it's going to be high stakes, high risk, high reward. I'm going to do it from a warehouse uh, where it's just a phone. Obviously, email wasn't really a thing yet. Um, and uh, it's going to be me and a bare bones team. Uh, I'm going to help people create the things they love, make them as big as possible. I'm going to do it half time from the mountains, half time from the beach and whatever it is, I'm going to be the best at it and stop when I'm 40. And we were in our garage. I just turned 41 and we're reading this thing. And it was like, O M F and G. What is this? It was like a prophecy about what happened with our first fund, lowercase. It's funny, we've run um, one of the most successful funds of all time and at, at its point was, you know, had billions of dollars under management and we've never even had a physical office. Uh, and so I say that because I never set about to build a legacy institutional business with our name on it. Instead, this was something that was driven entirely by passion for me. Like it was something I was obsessive about. And, you know, I mean, there's all that hustle porn about, you know, I, I mean, all those, you know, accessories and posters people put up. But the part I do subscribe to is when you're doing something you love, it doesn't feel like work. Uh, I would completely lose track of time in those early days helping people start companies. It, it felt very revolutionary what was happening in the early Web 2 era. 
And, uh, and so that was incredible and it felt great and it felt like the stuff we were doing mattered and it felt like we were empowering a whole new generation of builders that had been frozen out. People who didn't have big networks, who didn't have pedigrees, who didn't have the right degrees, who weren't able to access venture capital traditionally. Now they had stuff like open source software and cheap internet connections and machines they could afford and they cloud hosting and all this stuff that made it that it was, it was more than ever before up to the ambition and the drive of the individual entrepreneur to make something work. And because of all those tools, they could get something into the hands of a user without having to have a VC sign off on it. And so without all those gatekeepers, it just felt like an incredibly special time. And I'm, I feel so lucky for the timing of me getting into that business and the impact I was able to have and the results obviously, but as it went on, it started to feel emptier. I think tech in the beginning was a self-selecting group of actual builders and geeks and people who are kind of obsessed. Um, you know, like I, I went to college for math starting in seventh grade. I mean, I, I was just kind of that kind of person. Um, but as it became more popular and as you know, like the movie, the social network came out and things like that, we started seeing more people opt out of wall street and into Silicon Valley and the culture changed. And the, what, what felt like purpose just kind of went away from these companies. And so there was this point where I was just like, wait, it, do I really want to get up and, and put out fires for this kind of stuff every day? You know, as you get married and have kids, those priorities become clearer, those trade-offs. It's funny, you know, when, when I was on Shark Tank, you know, we would uh, do a deal with a company. When you invest in a company in our business, you're committing to them for 10 to 15 years. And you know, if I, if I went on The Bachelor and got married, everyone would expect me to be divorced in like six weeks. But I, when you do an actual investment in a startup, that is a 10 to 15 year long commitment. And so when I would see like new gadgets, I'd be like, okay, yeah, it's cool. And I like those founders and I feel like I could make that thing better. But is that really what I want to do for the next 10 to 15 years? And so that's where it all came, uh, you know, we're all ground to a halt. And it's, it was weird because it was at the height of the success of our business. Very hard to raise my first fund. But, you know, this time around, everyone wanted to invest with me. It was, there was, the opportunity was incredible. So that was a weird decision because I don't think anyone else in the world other than Crystal, my wife and business partner, understood why I was doing it. But to answer your question, the opposite of that is something that has happened recently where, you know, we started messing around trying to work on democracy improve access to voting and just basically stabilize the Republic after the last uh, four years. Um, we worked on some epidemiology stuff and funding research and testing there in the wake of uh, COVID. We work on a lot of criminal justice reform. We do a lot of work in prison. So I spend more time than most people who haven't been incarcerated in prisons. But along the way, we decided to get more deeply involved in climate solutions themselves. And what was cool about it was this chapter in our lives was finally by choice. It, it wasn't out of necessity. I think everything else I'd done up to that point was, you know, whether it was like get the degree that makes you most marketable or get the job that's going to pay off your student loans or now like enhance your resume. So this big company will hire you. And then even when I left Google, I wasn't rich. I, you know, they, I did really well there and I left a ton of money on the table when I left. But when I started my business, it was because I had to start a business. I couldn't go lie on a beach. What's, what's different this time is that everything we do now is by choice. And that's been amazing. And I'll tell you, the people who I admire most in the world are the people who get to that place before they have all the money and comfort to do so. Like those, I, I, I really, really love that. I love the people who have, who have no qualms about exercising their voice before they have any safety net or power. And I really admire the people who follow their passion, their heart, even when they don't have that safety net to fall back on. Um, that takes a lot of courage and, and I really admire it. And you know, I, I, it, it's easy for me to make these kinds of decisions now because I've got you know, FU money. Um, but those people who do them earlier and don't, I like hats off. Your previous fund was named Lowercase Capital. Your new fund upon your unretiring is named Lower Carbon Capital. And you don't need a Georgetown law degree to decipher the difference there and what it signals about the kinds of investments you are making and will be making. Now, there was a line in a Forbes piece you participated in earlier in 2021 that said you are now, quote, focused on an area that has historically proven kryptonite for venture capital returns, climate. 
What is the brief history, Chris, as we should know it, about how companies with climate change ambitions were once considered in investment circles and how that compares with how they are viewed now? It's the same kind of thing we saw in software. I'm going to go back to what happened with you know, Web 2.0 and the rise of Y Combinator and open source tools is that before then it cost millions of dollars to write the first line of code for your startup. You had to have proprietary development environments. You had to have your own racks of servers. I mean, literally, I, I worked at a startup where we would have to move our servers from data center to data center. And when it was server move day, it was like everybody in the company had to go and put some servers in their trunk and move. I think a lot of folks who are building these days don't understand those things. Um, I have a great friend, Greg Spiridellis, who's the CEO of a company called HiHo. And, um, but also earlier in his career, built Jib Jab and sold it and built Storybots and sold it to Netflix. An incredible entrepreneur um, and a guy who writes code. And so what was funny was he re when he recently started building HiHo, he, he just kept texting like, oh my God, the kids these days have no idea. He's like everything, like we take code from, you know, that's already been written out in these public repositories. Everything's hosted in the cloud. There's all these tools out there that we used to have to hammer together ourselves. It's amazing how the barriers to creating that stuff changed the entire landscape in, in web and app stuff. Well, the same thing happened in climate. There were a lot of factors. One, I, and I think the biggest that's, un, you know, that's unrecognized is machine learning. So much of the development for the advances in energy, uh, in, in electrical and mechanical engineering and building materials and industrial chemicals happens in the computer first. They can run simulation after simulation after simulation that would have in the past had to have been physical experiments that are lengthy and expensive. And so like we have not one, but we have three companies working on fusion right now. And instead of kind of an experiment that might take a month and then going and grinding on that data, instead they run tens of thousands of experiments in parallel in the machine. And that's why it's dramatically accelerated how close we are to net positive energy from fusion. Uh, and this happens across all of these areas. I mean, we, we have a company called Heart Aerospace that's making a fully electric airplane, 19 seat airplane. The entire team up until a month ago could fit in a 19 seat electric airplane. When, th when they originally pitched us, it's hard to use the word they, cause it was just a him. And, um, and we were like, how is this even possible? And we took it to, uh, friends at Boeing and Airbus and like, it's not possible, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, Anders, as he worked on it, showed us how you could model that whole thing with machine learning and build it. And sure enough, now he's got billions of dollars of actual orders not letters of intent, but literal orders from all the majors um, to order those planes. And so I think that's one major thing that's changed. Um, and then we see the same thing with shared lab space. In the same way that uh, shared computing clusters changed Web2, uh, we see the same thing happening in climate right now, is that you don't have to build your own bioreactor from scratch. You can go share one and rent it by the hour, literally. And so we see these things, you know, or easier technology transfer out of universities and licensing IP. And all of these things have built up to where in the days of Kleiner Perkins and Kosala and these guys who were investing in climate tech, they had a great nose for the technology. They built really strong science teams. And so it wasn't a folly. They backed the right stuff and they saw the trends coming. It was just too expensive back then. And so it took too much money to start those companies. And then because it was so expensive, the business models weren't there to make those companies sustainable. So they needed government intervention, subsidies, that kind of stuff to make those work. So at the same time they raised funds, they would bring on guys like Colin Powell and Al Gore to go lobby for them. And that's where it kind of broke. Now, to be clear, if you look at like Kleiner's famous energy fund, it actually did turn net positive in year like 13 or 14. And so they were right. They were just really, really early. But now economically, what we've seen is the cost of starting these things has come way down and the products they're selling can go either direct to consumer, direct to business or direct to government as a buyer, but they don't need subsidies. They don't need anyone else to step up and they don't need any regulatory changes to make the business work. And that's the window that we saw was that now when it's just between the builders and their users, that's a bet we like to take. You know, we do a lot to try and heal democracy in this country and, and beyond, although I think we're in kind of the worst state right now, but we do all we can to try and help that stuff. But the more we do, it just makes me frustrated with how our government works. And so I don't want to be in a position as an entrepreneur or as an investor to rely upon it ever. 
I want to be in a place where I can build something and offer it to somebody because it's just better, faster, cheaper, easier, more delicious, sexier, cooler, easier to use, better, easier to maintain, whatever the case. It's funny right now on the planet, we probably have a hundred million people or so who consciously buy and, and, you know, go through the world with climate on the mind, right? Try and buy a climate friendlier product or take one fewer trip or eat less red meat, whatever it is. But we need seven plus billion more of them to do that. And the path there isn't through guilt and shame. We're not going to get people there by making them feel bad about their lifestyles. We're going to get them there by offering them a better option. And so for me, the dream is getting a bunch of people who don't even realize they're hippies and tree huggers to just be making regular purchase decisions out of pure self-interest that turn out to be the right one for the climate. You know, here in Wyoming, we're the largest coal producing state in the United States. When I see solar panels go up here, it's not because anyone's making a political statement. Uh, this was the very first state that Trump won uh, in, the, in the last election. Nobody's trying to virtue signal here. It's because they're just damn cheaper to run your ranch off of solar than it is anything else. When I see windmills go up, it's because we're a damn windy state and that's where the opportunity is. And so when I see somebody driving you know, a hybrid truck, that's because it's just cheaper to operate. I mean, pre-sales for the Ford F-150 hybrid are off the charts here. And so that makes me happy because that is, we can bypass trying to convince people politically of this problem and instead just give them a better option. Okay, so this is a question that is for companies you might invest in or not, but in your mind, what is the right relationship between sustainability as a business and profitability as a business that you think the best companies will have in the future? Yeah, well, I think they're actually not going to be as mutually exclusive anymore. You know, as we think, it, let's get philosophical for a second. So, you know, carbon is the big thing that creates all these problems, right? Carbon is the primary greenhouse gas. There's a couple that are bad too, like methane is actually worse. There's just less of it. Uh, methane is, you know, natural gas. It's what comes out of the wells. It's what cows burp. Um, there's nitrous oxide is pretty nasty too. But the main one we're trying to all work on, and we have projects in those spaces, but the main one that we're all focused on is carbon. When we admit carbon, it goes up in the atmosphere, it traps uh, solar radiation, makes everything warmer, and we're screwed. Um, you know, it leads to extreme weather, drought, famine, mass migration. It's, it's a mess. Um, and so, and none of us can escape it in the same way none of us can escape this virus. So what we see is that carbon is actually an embedded cost in everything we do. I mean, if you think about it, it's expensive to dig up old dinosaur bones, move them around and burn them to power our economy. And that's literally what we do right now, right? And so it's just much cheaper to harness the sun and wind and plant life. I mean, we, we right now literally make industrial scale chemicals using enzymes instead of oil. And that company has 50 to 60% margins because it's just cheaper to do it that way. And so as we look around, we see when you take carbon out of a process, you're actually just making it cheaper. Right now, I mean, beef is expensive. It doesn't just have a big impact on the climate, but it takes a lot of land, a lot of water, a lot of feed, a lot of inefficiency. You know, we grow beef in a vat that's cultured beef. It's meat. It, if I gave you a burger, you'd be like, delicious. It tastes like meat. And yet it's just cheaper in the end to do it that way because we didn't have to mess with all of those inefficient inputs. And so, and ultimately carbon even has an economic value. Like carbon is necessary for things. I mean, not only is it in your sodas, uh, but it's used in a bunch of industrial processes. Ultimately it can be upcycled into jet fuel even. And we have a company working on that. And so what we see is that the opportunity here is to pull wastefulness out of processes that are making things more expensive. And so to answer it philosophically, the sustainability thing is actually a way of looking at where are we blowing money in our business right now, where, you know, often the cheapest option isn't actually the cheapest option when you take into account externalities, but where are we blowing money? And so that's number one. Number two is that when you really step back and look at it, people these days have more choice in where they work than ever before. I think the pandemic has highlighted that right? with, you know, the emergence of work from home, and just more efficiency in the labor market. So you just go on a job site and figure out where you're going next. And when you do that, you need to have a company that people feel proud to work at. And I think we have a generation of workers who are much more aware of 
the values of their company, where they source things from and what their net impact on the planet is. Any business owner listening right now knows that pretty much the number one challenge of the business is recruiting and retaining high quality people. You know, I mean, it was Larry and working for Larry and Sergey used to tell me like, look, a great engineer is worth 100 times more than a good engineer. And, you know, it felt like a joke at first. And then I watched how they paid people. And sometimes there were engineers who made 100x what somebody else made because they were just, they pulled it all together. They executed no drama. They had vision, et cetera. And so we all know that even in less extreme cases that it's so hard to attract talent and retain them. And one of the very best ways to do that is to have them believe in the mission of the company and the impact it's having on the planet. So even if you're doing something that doesn't feel particularly mission driven, would somebody feel proud to say they worked there? Would somebody feel proud to say like, look, even if we're building a kind of a goofy product and it's just fun, like is our net impact on the planet a positive one, right? Not everyone has to work on solving the climate crisis. Like I don't need everyone to drop everything they're doing and go build carbon sequestration devices. But, you know, I mean, I, you guys are the Shopify podcast. I obviously buy a ton of stuff of Shopify, including I have like an addiction to um, T-shirts with references to 80s movies. Like, you know, so I, like there, there are random businesses that need to exist. But in each of those businesses, ask yourself, like, are we having a net positive impact on the planet? You know, is the way our stuff is getting built and where we're sourcing it from, like helping or is it hurting? And I think as you do that, not only will you feel better about waking up in the morning and going to work and your kids will feel prouder of you, but you'll be able to attract and retain better and better talent um, and do fewer times sourcing and interviewing and paying job sites and all that crap that drives us all crazy when we're trying to grow a business. On this very show last year, Chris, we had Tim Brown, who co-founded and is co-CEO today of Allbirds, which is kind of like the darling of retail direct to consumer companies as it pertains to sustainability. And Allbirds, many know, has the very public ambition to one day leave zero carbon footprint behind in the making of its shoes. Now, Tim told us that sustainability means different things to different people. It could mean air quality, water quality, human conditions along the supply chain. You know, there are a lot of ways to parse that definition. To you, Chris, what have you learned is the most reachable and reasonable way that companies need to have sustainability show up in how they run their businesses moving forward? Yeah, I mean, look, we, we have companies in our portfolio that help other companies figure that out. One of the things that's tough, and I know you, you have so many business leaders and entrepreneurs listening, is it's hard to understand your supply chain. It's, it's hard to understand the impact. So where does this stuff come from and how does it get here? And there are so many different facets of that. So where do they source the raw material from? If you're making that t-shirt, where does that cotton come from? Where does that ink come from? Where is the place where they're applied together? What does the transport look like getting that thing over here? How is it packaged and wrapped, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, up until a consumer receives it. And it's hard to understand that, you know, we, we literally have companies that are like, we call them x-rays for your supply chain so that you can, and by the way, you can read about all of this stuff on lowercarboncapital.com. We literally have, I think 53 or 54 companies in the portfolio now. And so there's a lot of exciting ones there and it's a great place to find a job too. Um, but, but, you know, I think it's, I think it's sometimes hard. So I, I, my heart goes out to people who don't always know the impact they have. So it's been interesting. Some research came out recently that showed that this whole kind of putting it on individuals to fix the climate stuff, like making it about individual responsibility was literally promulgated, was started by the oil companies. So to take the focus off of them and put it on individuals. So instead of talking about the massive large scale things that need to change, they're like, Hey, it's up to you to turn your thermostat down. It's up to you to turn your lights off. And so, which are perfectly positive things, but they're not gonna change shit at scale, right? I mean, God bless anyone turning their lights off. I appreciate it. And so, and moving to LEDs, like that stuff does matter. But the reality is if we're really gonna change stuff at scale, we have to completely redo how energy is generated on this planet. We have to change from the ground up how buildings are made. I mean, buildings are massive emitters in terms of the, the concrete and steel when they're put together, how the HVAC works and those things. Like we have to change transportation, the emissions that come from transportation. We have to focus on agriculture and land use. Uh, I mean, it's, there's huge, huge opportunities there. And so as we look at every area of emissions, we focus on each one of those because we think there's business opportunities there. But that's where the stuff is really happening at scale. And so 
I think as a business leader, I just ask you to reflect on the question without getting specific and, you know, and over tactical, like, am I making the world better? Am I leaving it better than I found it? And, and through the business, not just through your individual actions, like, am I making choices in my business that are showing there is a market for more sustainable materials? You know, it's funny working again for Larry and Sergey, I was very inspired by them because not only were they some of the most aggressive business people I ever met, but one of the ways they took their responsibility to give back seriously is, you know, they sent me and some other employees or said, look, we want to outfit the campus with solar panels. I worked there from 03 to 07. So at the time, solar panels weren't really at the point of payback. So the money you spent on them, you were never going to recoup by savings yet. They just didn't have that kind of, of power generation capacity yet. Uh, but when I asked him, so why are we doing this? You know, I mean, it's the right thing to do, but why is it a good business decision? And what they said was, look, go to the guy who's making them. At the time, his name, Andrew Beebe, he's now a, a venture capitalist at Obvious Ventures and a guy I really admire. Uh, but they said, go to the guy who's making them and see if you can place a big enough order that he can literally change the factory where he gets those things made and bring the cost down as a result. Like place 10X what his regular business is and see if that can shift the cost to where you might get him to pay, to pay back. And if so, then we'll call up all the other companies around here and get them to buy them too. I love that kind of thinking, where by creating a market on our side, we're able to shift the cost curve for that industry. And as a result, get more adoption and then continue that cost curve. And now obviously solar panels pay for themselves within just a couple of years in a residential setting, even let alone a commercial setting. And so for me, I think that as a it, it, talking to entrepreneurs and talking to business leaders, it's do what you can to try and be aware. What is our impact? And then what kind of moves can we make at scale that will drive really, truly systemic, systemic change here? I wanted to shift gears a little here, Chris, and go back because there are some parts of your story that are quite frankly, irresistible to revisit. You suggested you were always a hustle kid. And some of the ways you made money when you were younger are almost right out of central casting in terms of hammering that point home. You've said that you sold walnuts up and down your street as a six-year-old in school. You ran a secret card game that took a rake, which of course is a commission. And we should mention here that you were in junior high at the time. And my personal favorite in law school at Georgetown, instead of going to class, you hosted a keg party where the guests didn't have to pay but instead had to bring their notes for the semester to get into the party that you would make copies of. And from there, that's how you built this repository of study material that you would use to take your exams. Now, I really just wanted any excuse to bring those items up, but I wanted to see if I couldn't also tie them back to a relevant question about the place your professional life ended up. You get pitched a lot for investments. There's no doubt about that. And I wanted to know how much of yourself you like to see in the people you get behind. In other words, what is the right mix you like to see of a traditional structured approach to business success versus just backing people with this totally preternatural, unrelenting hustle to succeed? Yeah. So, um, first of all, you did your research. Appreciate that. It's kind of fun to reflect on all those things. Uh, I don't even know where they're talked about, but it's kind of fun to string those together in one paragraph. I think one of the biggest challenges for an investor or a CEO or an entrepreneur is too much pattern matching is trying to say like, okay, this was the thing that worked and now I'm gonna do whatever I can to replicate that. If I try to hire another me or something like that, it's weird because the times have changed. There are things I don't understand. Like I, a few years ago, I had a young kid working for me. He was telling me about e-gaming and I'm like, what the, uh, e what, what the hell? Why would I care about e-gaming, right? And then, you know, I was like, mid range, not early, not late to crypto, but I still don't own any NFTs. I mean, I think that's the thing that really made me feel old, um, where I'm like, I get it, but I don't get it. Um, and so, so I, I, I really want to resist the temptation of foisting my idea of what a great entrepreneur or leader is on anybody else. Um, you know, we have this young kid who works for us named Harsh. I mean, Harsh, it absolutely was a hustler, like was in my inbox as an undergrad over and over again. Um, you know, I ignored some of those messages at first. I get a few hundred emails a day. So, but then I started seeing him pop up. And then when I actually looked at them, they were value added he was pulling, he was bringing companies to us. He was giving us some insights. And so 
we eventually kind of gave him a chat. He was smart. We asked him to do a little bit of work uh, and it was great. It was high quality. And as we collaborated with him more, we realized this kid's special. Um, and his life is very different than my life growing up. Uh, and so I think if I had had a, an image in mind of what he was supposed to be like, I would have completely whiffed on it. And instead he distinguished himself, not through any kind of weird obsessive, like, you know, finding my home address and knocking on my door in the middle of the night, but by just showing himself to be valuable, you know, and that's, what's funny as we, as we hire for lower carbon and we've been building out a team and we have this great science team, you know, we don't really post those jobs, um, because by the time we go to hire the people who are best for those jobs have kind of presented themselves to us or have, been, have made it onto our radar through a network of people who are like, Hey, go talk to Clea. She's helpful. Um, you know, like go pay attention because we just keep hearing this name. And as we meet with her, we're like, Oh my God, she's a genius. And so that doesn't come through a one ad. It just comes from kind of putting your hat in the ring a little bit. And so, uh, I've never really hired by resume, particularly because I think this job isn't one that, you know, you can base off a resume. I mean, Clay, Clay Dumas, our partner, um, never worked as a professional investor. Uh, he, um, went to a fancy school, but his first job out of that school was working for Barack Obama. The president liked him when he got elected, even though he'd only ever worn t-shirts with animal prints on them. And so the president gave him a job at the white house. He was beloved there and had a, a bunch of different roles in the white house, working for the deputy chief of staff and then the chief digital officer. And uh, Clay originally came to us because we needed help sorting through all these political startups that were formed in the wake of the 2016 election and trying to kind of un F what had happened then. And I couldn't make heads or tails. I asked some friends, a bunch of people recommended Clay. I reached out for references, President Barack Obama. Uh, I mean, then former President Barack Obama texted back within the hour, like, yes, hire him now. And which is a pretty solid reference. So we did. Uh, Clay turned out to be fantastic at that. But along the way, we said, hey, look, we have this portfolio of existing companies. Let's see how helpful you can be. And as we started sending them out, I would hear from founders. Clay's amazing. Can he be on our board? Um, which is incredible. And so that feedback loop was great. And as we introduced him to more of our investors, they learned to really like and trust this guy. And so we started to realize there was a real opportunity there to grow Clay into these other jobs. Now, it was funny because when we just went out and raised our fund that we announced today, um, nobody actually asked about Clay's resume. And so his resume doesn't read like an investor. He's never been a professional investor. And so he's a general partner in this fund, but he wasn't an investor. In fact, all they did was ask about ways in which Clay was helpful to our companies. And I think that is at the essence of it is like, what can you do to make it more likely that these things succeed? You know, years ago, I was asked to give a graduation speech and um, to a bunch of business school undergrads and, and, um, and MBA students. I, I focused on this concept of interestingness as one thing that we can all kind of get better at and use to be helpful. You know, and I don't, I, I think there are definitely people in your life who are very interesting, just natively interesting. Um, but I also think it's something that can be learned by putting yourself in new situations, exposing yourself to people who are unlike you traveling and asking other people for help, undertaking jobs and challenges and putting yourself in situations that are completely um, you know, unique and new to you, reading books that are outside of your comfort zone and building basically a base of life experiences that not just expand your horizons, but expand your empathy. And along the way, give you some good stories to tell and help you be a better storyteller. And um, you know, I always encourage people to practice being a better joke teller. Um, because I think these are the things that connect humanity and help solve problems, right? And so in the end, what I've found is that the people who succeed in these roles are interesting. They have these incredibly diverse backgrounds that I can't predict. They're amazing, actually. When you say, I mean, everyone who works for us, you kind of want to sit down and hear more like, holy shit, really? You lived there? You did what? You quit your job to do what? Oh my God, Wait, you hold the world record and huh? Like, oh, so you're one of the best players of this weird game? Amazing. Like you went, you became a pilot, you did, you know, so there's just this hodgepodge of life experiences that make them interesting. You want to be around them. And it's that diversity of life experiences that make them better problem solvers. And so for me, I, I steer as far away as I can from thinking about who thematically are we, are we going to hire? By the way, we do that with investments too. I wasn't looking for 
Twitter when we invested in Twitter. I wasn't looking for Twilio. I wasn't looking for Stripe. Like, you know, in the case of Stripe, I mean, I knew that Patrick and John were the two most intelligent people walking the planet Earth and had helped them get into the United States when they were 15 and 17, respectively, and was already intimidated by their brilliance. And now I feel like when I'm talking to them, I'm talking to the Wikipedia. Um, but but I so that I would have I would have invested in that company no matter what they were making. But with each company, I try to come to it with a fresh perspective. Like, what are they doing here? Um, and uh, and and see it with fresh eyes. You know, one of the things that happened is, you know, Uber kind of got built partly in our living room and we didn't have a thesis for it before that. It was just a problem. Garrett had this incredible idea about how to solve it and we all worked on it together. One of the challenges I saw after Uber was that, you know, there, there were VCs who were like, okay, I'm going in all in on the shared economy. And they'd write the canonical blog post about the shared economy and then they would invest in all these half-assed things that kind of you know, met the confirmation uh, bias of their blog post. And the results are disappointing. They ended up losing money because all they were really doing was doubling down on their own ego in a way and not looking at things with fresh eyes, just looking at things that felt like it made them feel right. And so I try and do the same thing with people is not come with like, hey, this is the kind of degree we're looking for or the number of years of experience or any of that, like this is, I, I don't want to know that. I want something, I want to see something that's just compelling and different and that surprises me and that I hope I don't have preconceived notions about, or if I do, it challenges them. And then I just, I, my main thing is I want to evaluate, are they helpful? Are they moving the needle forward? I mean, our, our secret at lower case and lower carbon is find the very best companies in the world and, you know, or make them find us, right? Be the first choice they want to make. Of those, use our experience, our science to understand and choose the very best. Uh, do deals with them that are a win for everybody else and then make those companies more valuable as a result of our involvement. So I can't guarantee the success of any one company, but I do know that with a lot of these projects, I can make them more likely to succeed. And so I hire people who I think can help make these companies more likely to succeed who can help us make sure that the best companies in the world come to us first, choose the best ones, and then make them more likely to succeed. And so I encourage your audience, your entrepreneurs, the people who are running stores, the people who are building businesses, as they think about hiring, is this somebody who is going to actually help the company be more successful rather than just filling out a job description and kind of meeting those criteria, asking themselves. You know, a long time ago, um, when I was at Google, I, I was at Google pretty early and we were trying to hire somebody um, and he, he wanted more stock than like the stock tables would grant him for his role. And a colleague of mine who was there relatively early said, well, I'll, I'll give some of my stock uh, if it helps hire that person. And we all looked at him like, whoa, really? Like, wh why would you do that? You know, we were already hundreds of people at the company and he said, well, because I know my remaining stock will be worth more as a result of that guy joining the company. It was such an incredible lesson for me. And I've carried that through every time, whether it's in a portfolio company or whether it's in my own firm, every time I give a piece of the company to somebody or in a portfolio company, approve stock options for somebody or just a hire letter, I, I, at, I make sure we ask ourselves again and again, is the remaining stock we have left after this grant going to be worth more? as a consequence of that person joining? Will they make the rest of the stock worth more money or not? And if the answer isn't a clear hell yes, then it's a hell no. And so I, that's, that's kind of how we approach everything here. You know, and as a result, we're a very, very lean team. I mean, I can't stand meetings. Um, I, I, I try and delegate everything I can. I try and be as radically transparent as possible so that if I make a decision, that decision never needs to come back to me again. It can be replicated until we've changed our minds someday. But part of that is just making sure I am hiring people who I am so confident can help and move it forward. All right, that concludes the first of a two-parter here with Chris Saka. Join us back on the same feed for part two, which is where things really get fun. We talk about some of the biggest names in Silicon Valley, and Chris shares what he thinks about each of them, and he does not hold back there. We get into some fun behind-the-scenes stuff about Shark Tank, and we also ask Chris to give us the do's and don'ts about pitching an investor that 
If you've ever been curious about the venture capital process or really about pitching anyone anything, you're going to want to hear. So come back for part two. You're not going to want to miss it.